to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. It might be my age. But man, I, I'm looking forward to the rapture. Amen. I'm just, and I know we all do, but at, at different stages of life, you know, it's, you know, you're going through things, you, you have a young family and you're, you know, you'd like to see your children grow up and, and marry them. And then, you know, then the rapture come after that. So you don't have to put up with your son-in-law or daughter-in-law. I'm not, my daughter-in-laws are great, by the way. But I'm joking, of course. Uh, man, I love, love my, all my kids and their spouses. It's just, it's, it's just, it's, it's wonderful. It's just a wonderful time in our life with all the grandkids and stuff. And the Lord um, still has us with, with fairly good health. And so it's, it's a blessing, right? And, uh, but I still, I don't know. There's just something within me. I'm, I'm just looking for the Lord's return. And there's so many things that are going on. And every generation has said that. I realize that. But it, it, we're, we're definitely closer than the previous generation. We know that for sure, right? And so as it looks good, it looks good to us. When you're newlyweds in a young family, sometimes you're not quite as anxious for the Lord's return. But when you got hip pain, you're ready. You're ready to go, right? And uh, let's read this passage if you're following along. I'm in 1 Corinthians in chapter 7, and I'm going to start reading at verse 29. This is literally, I, I, I was reading this passage, and it just, I, I got to admit, it's, it's, it's a little difficult you really have to digest it for a few minutes, and, and you're not going to have that much time because I'll let you out early, right? Uh, of course I will. Uh, verse 29, but this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none, and they that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy, as though they possessed not, and they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashioning of this world passeth away. You read this passage, and it, and it seems difficult to digest. They that have wives as, as though they had none. Those that are those that are weeping as, as they wept not and their joys as though they rejoice not. It's, it's difficult because what is being said here is exactly what it says and what it means and what you think it means is what it says. It says you're married and you have a wife, but by comparison to the time and, and the importance of the second coming of Jesus Christ by comparison you know the, the passage just hit me the passage that says unless you hate your uh, your mother your father your brother sister so on and so forth um, God's saying that and we know that's a comparison that he's not saying that you actually hate them but by comparison but your love of Christ is 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 by comparison he says is as if, as if you would hate them and this is a very similar situation here when he's saying the importance of your family, the importance of your marriage, all those things by comparison to the, import, the importance of the time that is short that we have time to get the gospel out. It's as though they have had none. It's as if we didn't have a family. It's as if those who were weeping, no matter what, the, no matter what was causing their weeping, the heartache, no matter what that was, it was as if they were not by comparison to the weight and the heaviness of Jesus Christ is going to return. And why is it so heavy? Why is it so passionate? Why is it as if that is nothing? Because we're speaking about people dying and going to hell for eternity. And so all of this life, it's as we as read a verse this morning, the grass that withereth and fadeth away. It's a very short span. Time is short. We know with God, one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. And when God tells us it's short, it is short. 
we, we're not here long and we don't have much time to make an impact in our world. Our time is short. And so God is telling us all these things that are earthly, even though these are things that, that God has ordained and has brought into our lives in there. I mean, uh, in the beginning, what? God made Adam and Eve, right? It's not good for man to be alone. All these things are absolutes in the Bible, and they're true. But God is saying here, by comparison to the importance and the understanding of the second coming and the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, these things are as even they weren't. They were not. Because it's so overshadowed. He's trying to get our attention that the return of our Lord, our time is short on this earth. And what God has given us as a church and as individuals is that we're going to reach the world. And that overshadows everything else in our life. That we get the gospel to people, that we preach the gospel, that we have all these things in our life that we see in our life that are so important to us. And so God picks out things that are very important to us. We speak, think of weeping here and sorrow. So perhaps it's a loss of a loved one, right? We see the value, and not only the value, but the importance in our lives of family and marriage. But God is calling into our attention that people dying and going to hell permanently, like eternally, needs to be preeminent in our minds and in our hearts above all, literally above all else that's going on. What's the other thing that he says here? Um, uh, verse 30, it says, And they that weep as though they wept not, and those that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possess not. It says if that possession that you bought that just, you know, it's a, um, Something that you saved up maybe and something that you look forward to getting and maybe it was to buy a house or maybe fill in the blank. But something that is of great value, but it's the, as though you possess it not. By comparison to the importance of the gospel of Jesus Christ getting to our world. Because time is short for us. We know not when our Lord will come, but he has, since he left us and ascended into heaven, we have been commanded that we reach out to people because of the coming of the Lord. We know not when it is. The Old and New Testament are replete in the promises of Jesus Christ is coming again. In the Old Testament alone, just somebody throw me out a guess. How many times do you think the, the, the second coming or the return of our Lord is in the Old Testament. I'll give you a clue. It's 1,800 times. 1,800 times in the Old Testament, the return of our Lord is in the Old Testament. How many were shocked at that number? <laughs> That's a lot of times in the Old Testament that we're told there's 260 chapters in the New Testament. There's 20, um, 23 out of the 27 books reference the Lord's return. So there's 27 books in the New Testament. 20, 23 of the 27 mention the Lord's return. And there's, uh, there's 300 references to the Lord's return out of 260 chapters in the New Testament. Obviously, much fewer pages than the Old Testament. But understand, we're, we're talking here 2,100 times our Lord's return is told to us in the Word of God. That's striking, is it not? So we understand when it's 2,100 times, I mean, we all understand if the Bible says something once, it's true. If it says it, if it said it 10 times, we'd say, well, wow, that's extraordinary. If we said it was 100 times in the Bible, we would say, really? 2,100 times we're told that our Lord is going to return someday in this book. 2,100 times. That's important. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think we have words for how important that is. And so God is trying to call our attention in this passage in the New Testament to us New Testament believers on these things that he would look at us and say, these are the things I believe you value the most. So I'm going to pick these three things out. Your family, uh, your, your, your treasure or your possessions, and your emotions. Maybe heartache or whatever it might be, but your emotions, basically. These three areas he's calling our attention to, these three areas are not to get you sidetracked away from what you're supposed to be doing for the Lord Jesus Christ and getting the gospel to this world. 
I'm going to read you many scriptures here. I, I probably won't read nearly as many as what I have here. But uh, Titus 2.13, looking for the blessed hope, that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. John 14, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, did he go? Oh, yes, he did. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others who have, which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So those that have died, they'll go before us. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. As we know, those that are in the grave or have been buried, they will rise first and then we'll rise to meet them in the air in the second in the rapture. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And there's a lot of neat places on this planet. You know, that you could go on vacation and it just, it would be neat to see, uh, I don't know, the seven wonders of the world, but just, just, there's just amazing things to see. But man, to be caught up in the air, to meet the Lord in the air and have a new body when you got to heaven, oh man, there's no ride like that one. That's the one. That is the ride we're looking for. Disney World's got rides, everybody's got some kind of entertainment ride, but this, this, this is the ride. And, uh, and it's just in the, literally in the twinkling of an eye will be caught up. I mean, before you could say the word rapture, you'd, you'd be there. And um, yeah, I'm ready for a new body. Amen. <laughs> Amen, Brother Childers, we're ready for a new body. Uh, oh, my goodness, the references of our Lord's return. He speaks in 4.16 that Jesus will come in like manner as we've seen him go. He, he rose. Songs that we sing, we sang a couple tonight. He's coming again, he's coming again. The very same Jesus rejected of men. He's coming again with power and great glory. He is coming again. But the next time he comes, we sang it tonight. He won't have to die for me. And there won't be a Calvary. Coming again, coming again. Maybe morning, maybe noon. Maybe evening and maybe this evening, amen. Of course, the dead in Christ will rise and will join them. The rapture, soul, and spirit will be united with their new bodies. I wonder what that's going to look like. I know it's going to look better than this. A new body. Christians caught up to meet the Lord. Oh, what's singing, oh, what's shouting on that happy morning when we all shall rise. I don't know what we're going to be singing, but I guarantee you I'm going to be singing all the way. It's going to be a, twi it's going to be a twinkle song, but it's going to be quick, but I, man, alive. Can you imagine? I don't know. I just have this great desire. I love singing the song that we sing with the men at the end of both of those events now that was just, uh, again, uh, Tyler, you, you know what I'm talking about, right? I saw your smile. And I was thinking of you while we were there because this, the auditorium was a little smaller and the acoustics were hot. I mean, it was really resonating. And uh, Tyler likes to sing at those events. And it's, it's like that because the men just kind of, um, they just let it rip. You know, they're not worried about if they're on tune or whatever. And, and, and you guys understand it. I mean, it sounds great. I mean, it's just, it's just remarkable how good it sounds. And I was thinking to myself, it's a shame. And I, I don't... I normally am sarcastic, but I'm serious about this. But uh, you ladies really would en you would enjoy hearing it, just to hear the men sing. I, you you really would enjoy it. And I, I know it, you know there's no ladies allowed, so you're not you're not going to hear it. But it it really is um, striking just to hear all those men just, I mean, from their hearts and with full throttle. Wouldn't you agree, Al? I think everybody was just hitting it. Three hundred men. And it was, uh, 
it was it was really wonderful and I just I think of heaven and I don't know what that I love the song all hail the power of Jesus name it's one of my favorite songs and I just I just dream that one day we'll sing that song to Jesus Christ all hail the power of Jesus name and how we can all prostrate fall right uh, bring forth a royal diadem and crown him Lord of all man to be at his feet to be singing can you imagine how loud and how hard you're going to sing when you see the lord i mean we were gathered there with all those men and men we were singing from our hearts and we were singing as loud as we could but man i'll find another page of loud and when i'm in heaven singing to the lord it may not sound good but i'll tell you what i'm going to give it my all just to be able to sing these songs to our lord and savior of whom they were written of and probably so many songs that um will diminish the songs we love so much now. Can you imagine the songs of heaven about our Lord and about our God? I just, uh, what a day that will truly be when our Jesus will see. We're all busy with the cares of this world. In a sports sense, we would say to players, get your head in the game. Keep your head in the game. Don't be distracted. You get, you, you get the huddle in there. The coach is going to say, guys, get your head in the game. And I, I think about the, what, what, he, what Paul, or uh, I'm sorry, yes, Paul, Apostle Paul Corinthians here, what he's saying to us is, is folks, you, you've got all this stuff going on in your life. And understand a wife and family is important. Understand that sorrows and, and weeping and those things are important matters in your life that cause you to weep and, and to be brokenhearted and, and your emotions and, and possessions are not sinful, but he's just saying all these things, they're not the main thing. All, all these things are just peripherals of life. The main thing that's going on in your life is that you're a child of God. And that God has called us to a work to reach people for the Lord Jesus Christ. A coach would say to his players, they'd say, but, but coach. And what would the coach say? Don't but coach me. You do what I tell you. You, do, you. you keep the main thing the main thing. And, th and this passage, when I'm reading it, I'm saying to myself, is that what I think he means? And I keep reading it, and I go back over it, and it's like, yeah, that's exactly what he's saying here. All of these things, they, they just are so meaningless in comparison to eternity. We, we, we really can't wrap our brains about that because we're all about time, right? Time change, got an extra hour of sleep, so everybody's in a good mood tonight, right? But especially for the guys that went to the meeting, right? You got a little like, extra rest, Wilbur. But all these things that we have in our lives that are so important to us that take our focus away from the Lord. And all of us, and all of us do it. We're all guilty. We're supposed to love the Lord with our whole heart. Our Lord Jesus literally could return before this service is out and we would be gone. The signs of the times, as we know, we can look at it and say, yes, indeed, the signs are everywhere. Family often dominates. Family is our delight. Our children are so precious to us. It's really hard for us, literally, with the love that we have for our families and the joy. Um, I mentioned earlier, the, especially the young families, because you're looking forward to your children growing up and all those things. But I, I will tell you, the delight of my, of my life is still my children, my grandchildren, my wife. Those, those, those things are still just as precious to me, and they're just to continue to watch them grow up and see my granddaughters get married and all those things. Of course, you know, we still, it's different than when you're young, but it's still such a delight of life to have all these special relationships. And yet God says all of the value, all the love that you place in these things, It's very little value by comparison. And that is so hard for us to manage here on earth and understand. Just calling your attention tonight to what we do at Gospel Light Baptist Church is so important. 
It's above all else in our lives. It is the preeminent thing. What does the Bible tell us in the commandments? That we are to what? To love the Lord God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our might. Do we all agree that we know that we're supposed to love God more than anything else in our life? We all know that. We all understand that. We all struggle with it, though, that we love the Lord. I would challenge you, as I have many times, tell God, tell Jesus, and tell the Holy Spirit that you love them every day. It makes it more real if you'll just, when you're in prayer, just say, I love you, Lord Jesus. God, I thank you for these things. I love you, God. Holy Spirit, thank you for what you do in my life, the leading and, and all the things that the Holy Spirit does in comfort. I love you, Holy Spirit. There's three entities to the Godhead. And so I, I, I feel funny about just saying I love you to one of them. Does that make sense? And I know they're a triune God. But I just, but as God leads you in that, get in the habit of telling God you love him. Because saying it to him will make you think about it. It'll make you think about it. You say, well, God knows my heart. He knows I love him. Your wife knows your heart too, but she still wants to hear it, right? I still want to hear it, right? I think God wants to hear it too. There's something about speaking something rather than just thinking it. Have you ever had something happen in your life that was really a a really difficult thing. I don't mean to go here, but I, I, it's just the illustration, sorry. I, I kind of, at some point, I managed that Clinton had nearly drowned. But Dan, when I called somebody and tried to tell them, I just broke down. I, I wasn't crying when I called them, but when I said it, 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 there was just, it was just, I don't know, I just, it was just hard to say. I didn't, I didn't see it coming. I mean, you, you, you adults know what I'm talking about. You, you're thinking it. You're, you seem like you're okay, but then when you say it, there's something, there's something in your emotions that happens differently when, when you speak and hear the words yourself. And so when, when it comes to, well, God knows I love him. He knows my heart. But there's something different that takes place in your emotions when you speak the words. And you tell him verbally, I love you, Lord. So I think it's an important thing that we add to our prayer life is our love for God. Because we, we could tell everybody around us that we love them. We could tell our children. We could tell our wife. But God is telling us in this passage, we're supposed to love the Lord God with all our heart. He is supposed to be preeminent. Jesus Christ is our Savior, our Lord. These are the preeminent things in our life. And on this earth, it's difficult to manage these things. Best-selling books in the Christian bookstore. Books on marriage and family problems. Number two, overcoming depression. Number three, money management. I still have it open in my Bible. If you still have this open in your Bible, 1 Corinthians Chapter 7, verse 29. But this I say, brother, in the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives. What's the best selling book? Marriage problems. That's what we're concerned about. As though they had none. Verse 30. And they that weep, as though they wept not. What's that? Emotions. Family, our emotions. Some would say, Pastor, I'm, I'm overcoming depression or I'm discouraged or you fill in all the emotional words you want to fill in. God is, God is saying to us, suck it up, buttercup. Put your emotions aside. There's a world going to hell and they'll be there eternally. This has to happen. We have, to, we have to answer the call that God has called us to. And he doesn't want to hear that I got a problem at home with the family. He doesn't want to hear, is he concerned? Of course. And if you got a problem, get the book, read it, and do all you can to fix your family. 
But, but understand something. Everything the Apostle Paul says, and what's the last thing in the verse there, the last phrase? And they that buy as though they possess not. The three things that these books are basically about are these things, the three things that the Apostle Paul is telling us. These are the three areas that, that we're going to struggle with putting above our Lord and above what our call is. Our Lord is coming soon. Our time on earth is short. I can't grasp totally what this is saying. But I know one thing for sure. God is saying eternity, salvation, the work you do for Christ is more than any other thing of importance in your life. There's nothing that will measure to it. And I don't think we're going to have to be a thousand years in heaven like we're even going to be counting, right? There's no night there. But I don't think we'll have to be there very long to understand. Oh, now I get it. Oh, now I get it. All these other folks are in hell, and I'm in heaven. But it's going to be too late. Our time is short. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and this challenge from the word of God. Father, the apostle Paul writes, writes to us of the most things that we value most in life that we can be distracted from the work of God by every one of these things. Father, every one of these things pull people out of church, pull them out of the ministry, pull them Father, away from you, all these three things are the things that keep us from serving you, keep us from doing those things that you've called us to as Christians. I pray, Father, that we would reevaluate not our amount of love for all of these relationships in our life, but, Father, we would reevaluate our earnest and our desire to see people come to Christ in a short time that we have left on this earth, no matter our age, it is short. Thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to hear the gospel, receive it, have Christ in our life, heaven is our home, all these things that we have in Christ. May we understand the value above all else to give this gospel to others.